Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, policy exchange event on smart cities, which is kindly sponsored by Nominet. Uh, my name is John Elledge. I'm a journalist with the New Statesman, <coughs> where I'm mostly responsible for our city's vertical city metric. Um, there are a number of trends I've kind of spotted running city metric over the last year, but two of the bigger ones uh, are the ones we're talking about today. One is this notion that cities are, for want of a better term, our future. That's where all the economic growth is happening. That's where you know, an ever-increasing share of the world's population is going to live. Um, that's where we can solve the world's problems. The biggest manifestation of that in the British context <coughs> is, of course, the Northern Powerhouse policy. The other trend I've, uh, I write about quite a lot is uh, what's known as smart cities, the, the use of technology to, to gather data and one hopes use it to, to improve the workings of cities, whether that means transport systems or resource usage or, or planning. There isn't actually that much dialogue between these two trends, though. Um, when we talk about things like the Northern Powerhouse, we tend to think largely about physical infrastructure um, and, and political power. Um, and the smart city stuff often sort of exists in a bit of a bubble, I think. Um, consequently, it's not actually clear that cities are making the best use of, of the powers and information they have at the moment. Um, we can give them more powers, but you've got to question whether, if we give them these levers, if they're actually connected up to anything. It's that, that's our topic for today, um, whether, you know, how we can create this dialogue between the kind of two, those two aspects of, of cities' policies. Um, before moving on to our speakers, I'm just going to introduce them uh, one by one. On my far left, we have Lord Holmes of Richmond, is a Paralympian, a lawyer, and a uh, prolific author with a special interest in smart cities. Um, to my immediate left, we have Russell Howarth, who's the chief executive of the Nominet, uh, which is working on an Internet of Things system for Oxford. To my right, we have Eddie Copeland, who is head of technology policy for Policy Exchange. <coughs> and at the end there, we have Gavin Starks, who's chief executive of the Open Data Institute and who's also involved in uh, the Mayor of London's Smart London program. To begin, I'd like to turn to Russell Howard from Nominet and uh, ask him to sort of give us a, a technology company's view on, on these issues and perhaps talk a bit about their work in Oxford. Well, first of all, very good morning and thank you for coming to this event. Uh, we're very pleased to be working with the Policy Exchange uh, to host this event this morning. <coughs> this topic of smart cities is a very large one, so unpacking it is, is, is going to be very difficult to do in an hour, but what I'm going to try and do is tackle it in three different ways. And the first way I'd like to talk about it is kind of what it means to be smart. What is a smart city and, and what does that involve? The second component I thought would be useful to touch on is the advantages that the UK have in becoming uh, a, a, a real name in the smart cities environments around the world. But none of this will come without challenges. So I thought I'd come on to address what I see as two challenges for the smart city evolution. I think it's, when I really look at the big picture of uh, smart cities, there are a couple of key drivers which make me feel like there is going to be real momentum over the next certainly 10 years towards the evolution of smart cities. And I boil those down to three areas. One, urbanisation. And you may be aware that 80% already of the UK's population is already, uh, are already in cities. So the urbanisation element is critical for us to ensure cities of the future become more uh, environmentally aware of how we can use technology. The second one is ageing infrastructure. And I think uh, most of us in the room would agree that uh, there's plenty of challenges given the historical nature of a lot of the cities. I'm living near Oxford, so I see it from my own eyes as to the historical challenges uh, in cities that we've all got to try and uh, adapt to. <coughs> and then the third one's around the environment and trying to make our cities a lot more environmentally friendly for the citizens of those cities. And I look at the market and think, actually, from a very t topographical point of view, there's a very significant opportunity, and there's been estimates of around 400 billion uh, as a value put to the concept of smart cities, and that feels 
the sort of quantum that I think will evolve over the, certainly the next 10 to 15 years. But there's more to smart cities, in my view, than kind of shiny devices and IoT, and I think we can get very much lost in the whole, isn't this cool, um, can't this be a really excellent opportunity for device manufacturers? I'm from the data background, and, and I think that uh, data plays a significant role in how we can really evolve the concept of smart cities, and done well, uh, really will be the foundational blocks for smart cities to take traction. So I want to talk about a little bit about data, and as you may know, two-thirds of the UK's population, certainly the adult population, uh, has smartphones. And so the evolution of smartphones, the integration of smart technology in our lives is prolific already. 4G is only accelerating that. We've seen uh, an uptake of 4G that is eight times the exit rate of 2013, and it's developed eight times uh, in 2014. So the adoption of broadband, the adoption of 4G uh, in our lives uh, and across businesses is significant. Smartphones are collecting data. That's enabling us to measure all sorts of things that we've never been able to measure before, right the way through down to uh, health applications, to uh, all sorts of uh, fitness trackers, in-car entertainment systems, but then the concept of smart cities goes way beyond that and transcends into electricity meters that you may have plugged to the walls of your home. So there's lots of data floating out there, and I think the challenge is how to bring the various silos of data, whether that's existing in the private sector, the consumers, or within the government, to then draw that data together and start to mine it to really bring up <coughs> insights that we can then use for action. And you know, for me, that's a, that's a key. The second element I want to come on to is around what it means to be smart. And talking about the kind of rhetoric of smart cities and the internet of things that I've mentioned isn't all about sensors. Um, I, th I really think that you know, some of the things that we've talked about as nominate and things that we've seen in the smart cities environment, so kind of red herrings, if you will. You know, do we really need lampposts that uh, can send text messages? Do we need mailboxes that can be really smart? I don't. I don't. I think these things are kind of novel, but they're not really targeting the key opportunities for cities around the infrastructure point, around the environment point, and around the opportunity to uh, really shed some more light on efficient living in urban environments. So for me, I think it's really around what, question, what projects can make a big difference in the smart cities. And I really think that uh, starting on examples uh, that when you look to New York, and I'm sure we'll come on to some of the work that, um, that's been mentioned by Eddie's report on the New York model, where they've looked at taking data sets, mining the data sets, and coming out with actionable data, is perhaps the first step in the journey of becoming a smart city. I think the UK has a number of inherent challenges, but equally advantages, and I'll just come on to a few of those. As I've already said, the UK is very much ingrained in the technological environment. We are one of the leaders, or if not the leader in the G20, for technological adoption. So good fundamental starting point. The second is we're, as a society, quite comfortable with surveillance and digital surveillance and uh, you know you look at the uh, overall digitization of the CCTV cameras around the UK we are one of the most uh, significant users of CCTV cameras and I think if, if we see as an, as an organization as a country public benefit for uh, the application of the technology in the wild then people will uh, adopt to the smart cities concept and I think that's one of the areas which uh, helps us to uh, ensure that we can leverage our inherent uh, prejudice to embrace technology. And then the third one's around the propensity of government organizations, being organizations like the NHS, um, that have tremendous amounts of data but just haven't necessarily used it and converged it with other data sets to really drive the adoption. So I'm running out of time, but effectively I want to uh, just leave you with the thought that the data applications and how we can use smart data. So if we can bring together smart parking, 
smart uh, <coughs> bus routes, traffic management, we start to aggregate those together to help hospitals and the like, not just manage uh, how efficient we can deal with patients, but equally how we ensure that patients get to the hospital appointment on time. How can they make sure that they are delivering emergency services in the right way to avoid traffic incidents? So there's loads of applications which we're not even there yet as a city and as a city environment that I think there's lots to draw on. And in essence, that's going to require a significant degree of collaboration both in terms of the private sector and the <coughs> public sector. So I can get into that in more detail, but in a nutshell, that's, that's kind of where our philosophy is at Nominet, and we're doing a lot of work to try and bring together different uh, devices, the Internet of Things, and data sets to try and draw in less analytics and insight that we can re really lead to actionable data. Thank you, Russell. Next, we're going to turn to Lord Holmes of Richmond, who has a special interest in smart cities and I understand was recently involved in trialling a sort of high-tech navigation system for the visually impaired with Microsoft. Thank Lord you. Lord Holmes. Uh, good morning and thank you to <coughs> Policy Exchange for this uh, invitation to nominate for their sponsorship. Uh, before I get into that, with Russell's um, reference to lampposts, I'm reminded of the old uh, quote that... Uh, Politicians use statistics like a drunken man uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. <laughs> and I think in many ways that takes us into this of how we not only have to use stats but also the data that's available to us to really drive some transformational change here. In many ways we're only now, I think, at the end and really feeling the end of the Victorian era as we move into the very low foothills of the digital opportunity. We've got infrastructure, particularly in terms of transport and the built environment, which was both innovative, beautiful and extraordinary, but in the Victorian age, and we're still relying on that now. What the digital opportunity offers us is quite extraordinary and not least in this whole question of smart cities. I was trialling a bit of kit last year in Reading where there's a collaboration between Microsoft, some of the local businesses, the local borough council. It's effectively a way <coughs> of navigating your way around a city with Bluetooth beacons, wearing a headset which gives beats in each ear so you walk straight down a line it's also giving information saying what road you're on and you get to the bus stop not only does it say there's a bus coming it tells you which bus is coming you get on the bus sitting on the bus tells you where you are then you press a more detailed button it will say passing the university press for more information it'll say the university got its uh, royal charter in 1926 <laughs> you're getting this levels of engagement in the retail section it tells you about where the bank is what services it's got now Microsoft aren't developing that bit of kit to help blind people per se. They're a great company, they've got great CSR, they're a fantastic tech business. The reason why they've taken the blind person example is because they believe if they can crack this for a blind person, they will have come up with a system, a way of interacting and engaging with a local area, in this example a city, which will be phenomenally saleable, phenomenally of interest to everybody in that population. And this stuff's only available because of the technology and because of the data which now exists to be processed at such speed. We're in an age like no other. It's extraordinary how few people appreciate the changes that are coming down the track here. This is a golden age to be alive. You see a number of applications, as Russell said, with lampposts that text and stuff. You see a number of things that are called technologically revolutionary, but actually they're very often just using a bit of kit to do something in exactly the same way that we were doing it before. And really that has very little purpose, it doesn't take us very far at all. What we need to do is smash those silos 
have horizontal connections across all this stuff, data being the driver for that, to suddenly appreciate what is possible in these silicon cities. For anybody who hasn't looked at policy exchanges, work on this, I know Eddie as the, uh, the king of all these reports from uh, policy exchange, go online and read all those reports, they're fascinating. And not only do they give you the detail that you need, the great thing about them is there's a thread going through them, which is a thread of excitement and possibility as to what this can bring to our city environments. Yes, devolution offers a tremendous opportunity, particularly we're in the heart of it here, the heart of the northern powerhouse, Devo Mank, as called this will be a beating heart of what's possible. But there has to be a connection, an absolute joining at the hip of those powers to the possibilities. Fantastic to have transport, other systems that connect all this stuff, put into the mix, put under the grip of these new powerhouses. But that's got to come alongside what can be done with that. Pointless to have that without thinking, how are we going to use that? How are we going to use data to do this stuff, not in a marginally different way, but in an innovative, in an insightful, fundamentally different way? And it goes wider than just the systems, because with all of this stuff, with all the opportunities, Internet of Things, big data, AI, robotics, we truly can transform the way we do stuff in our cities, but fundamentally it's got to be in a way which is not only efficient, effective, it's got to be in a way which is appealing and draws in the talent to these cities, because you've still got a phenomenal drain, people going to the southeast, going to London, you can get to London at 77 miles an hour, you can get across this area at 46 miles an hour by rail. We need to have the talent connected to these cities, which will really drive the possibility. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal time to be alive. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to turn to Gavin Starks, who's the Chief Executive of the Open Data Institute. Gavin. Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you uh, very much for inviting me here. Um, for those of you who don't know or haven't heard of the Open Data Institute, uh, we're an independent non-profit. And we're very fortunate to have some stellar people on our board. Uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web. Sir Nigel Shadbolt, who's a world leader in artificial intelligence. Martha Lane Fox. And Neely Crohn's, uh, who was formerly at the European Commission. The work that we're doing and the work that we see happening is really uh, quite astonishing. and It really builds on the, on the last two speakers' points. If you think back um, to the original internet. They created roughly three billion addresses for internet connected devices. Uh, it wasn't enough. That's quite an astonishing fact. Uh, in fact now there are more uh, devices connected to the web than there are people connected to the web. And there are more people connected to the web than were alive when I was born. Uh, that's quite an astonishing in fact, in itself, the population has more than doubled uh, since most of us in this room were born. Um, this has a lot of really fundamental consequences for the way that we operate as a society. And the transition that we see is a long-term transition, but it's happening quickly. You know, this classic thing of change happens more quickly than you think in the long term, but it doesn't feel like it necessarily when you're in the middle of it. And what we're seeing is a transition from a closed culture, so one where businesses or, or people look at the first port of call is let's restrict access to our data, let's restrict access to our information, let's patent, let's uh, find ways of monetizing uh, the intellectual property or monetizing uh, things in a closed way, to one where we're looking at the opposite of that. We're looking to monetize the number of connections made rather than exploitation of individual points uh, to a smaller number of people. And there's a lot of different trends here, and I'd pick up one just from this morning. AstraZeneca have now started to open up 
their uh, research data around cancer for crowdsourced solutions. So how can, we cl how can everybody help tackle cancer? What an amazing thing to be able to do. You know, what an astonishing, if you've got someone using a smartphone um, anywhere in the world can now engage in that kind of activity. With the work we're doing with the Smart London Board, uh, where I said every single page of our recommendations has the word open, whether that's open innovation, open business, but largely it's centred around open data. And open data is data that anyone can access, use and share. Now, we're not talking about opening up personal health records, just to be very clear. Personal data is not open data. Just, I'd like to really make that point, uh, probably labour that point a little bit. We've defined a thing called the data spectrum, which goes from closed to shared to open. There are already rules for sharing uh, medical records with researchers under very strict guidelines, and so that counts under shared data. But there's some important questions to ask in here when we have more devices connected to the internet than people. The projections for 2020 are that between 20 and 50 billion devices will be connected to the internet. That's an astonishing number, and it will mean that the world is instrumented in very different ways. And whether or not you're emitting data about you, or whether everybody else around you is inferring data about you, that's, that's some really important questions we have to ask about the social contract between us and the state and us and businesses. So these are some of the questions that we're trying to tackle. And in a smart city context, for us the smart city is not about technology, it's about a behaviour change to open. How can we enable the tools that are being produced? And smart city technologies, if I can frame it as smart city technologies, can help open cities enable people to innovate in their own communities, in their own businesses, and help them employ, uh, uh, innovate, and create new ideas, new efficiencies in what they're doing. There are huge efficiency savings to be made. We've identified hundreds of millions of pounds worth of savings across every sector. We did a survey earlier this year of 270 businesses, and every single one of them is using not just open data from government, but half of them are sharing data with each other. Actually sharing open data with each other in most cases. You could be wrapping up, please. Sure. And um, these cultural shifts, and really it's a behaviour change, it's a way of thinking, the, the work that we're doing both in the Smart London Board and with the ODI, it's helping organisations, whether they're in government, um, whether they're in businesses, think about how can we innovate, how can we create open innovation within our organisations. And what we're seeing is that that innovation is going to come from network thinking. It's going to be not just inside the organisation, it's going to be engaging with other actors from around the country and other actors from around the world. Last but not least, we're going to turn to Eddie Kirkman from Policy Exchange. Eddie. Thank you. Well, a bit of uh, audience interaction. If I can ask you to imagine that you are the newly elected mayor of a, a city region that's just received devolved powers, and you walk into the boardroom on that very first day, and you've got local authorities there, you've got public sector partners there, you've got the LEPs there, and you're saying, right, guys, we need to deliver the government's agenda of economic reform, economic growth, and public sector reform in our regions. How are we going to do it? And I'm sure someone around the table will say, well, First of all, we need to measure the scale of the demand, the scale of the problem, the scale of what we're trying to achieve across all these different organisations. And then someone else will say, well, we need to execute our powers to deliver those objectives. So um, how can we do it? We should, we should join up some services. Perhaps we need to get our information together so we can target our scarce resources at areas of greatest need, at people who need the support um, of our organisations the most. Perhaps we need to predict where problems will occur and intervene early when minimum harm has been caused, when problems are cheap and easy to resolve, rather than the usual public services model of addressing failure after it's happened. And then someone will finally say, well, look, look guys, if, if we're going to do this right, we also need to you know, measure what we're doing. Remember what Michael Bloomberg said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And someone from central government is going to want to know how effectively we are using all of these new powers that we've got. 
Now, as I've discovered over the course of several recent reports, all of those things require making smarter use of data. The problem is that across the public sector and the private sector, we exist in these incredible data silos that prevent us from joining up, from targeting, from coordinating, from predicting and preventing. And I was astonished. If we're looking for mayoral models around the UK, you can obviously look to London. And I was talking to their head of intelligence who told me that the mayor of London, in terms of the data that he uses on a day-to-day -day basis, the only data they collect from each of the 33 boroughs is that collected for statutory purposes. It's astonishing. We're driving, you know, one of the greatest cities in the world, a capital city, uh, not using data from the boroughs over which the mayor has control. So what's the relevance to smart cities, because I've just described what it looks like if you have city devolution without smart cities. And there's many smart city models, some focus on the technology, some focus on lampposts. The one that I love and that I think has real legs and where we should start is this famous example of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics from New York City. Um, I'll briefly explain it. So Michael Bloomberg became the 108th Mayor of New York and a data-driven kind of guy, that's how he made his billions, wanted to bring data analytics to running a city. He set up a small team of just nine people who can bring data together from the 40 separate public sector organisations that operate across the city, the five separate boroughs, and they correlate, overlap that data, so they can predict and prevent things before they become severe. And the famous example is the fact that in New York they get 18,000 calls every year about illegally converted apartments. So apartments which are health hazards, where people get exploited, uh, where uh, yeah, very vulnerable people have occasionally died in, um, in terrible fires. And so they realise that of those 18,000 calls they get every year, only 8% are actually about genuinely dangerous buildings. There's a lot of nosy neighbours who unfortunately report it incorrectly. And they said, well, wouldn't it be great if we could increase the effectiveness with which we get to that 8% soon to prevent bad things from happening? <coughs> and they realised that if they brought together date on the age of a building, if it was made before 1939, before certain building regs came in, it was high risk. If the tax was in arrears, uh, it was high risk. If the utilities bills were in arrears, it was high risk. If the square footage of the apartment was below 3,000 square foot, weirdly, that made it higher risk um, as well. And they were able to increase the efficiency of their investigations to those high risk properties fivefold. That is the model that I think that we need uh, to accompany mayors as they take on those new responsibilities so that they can uh, take, carry out their powers. Why should smart cities be interested in city devolution? Well, at the moment, we know they struggle with having to deal with fragmented local government. How do you do a city-scale project when you have to negotiate with umpteen different public sector bodies? You've got siloed budgets, and those siloed budgets are small anyway because of this era of austerity. And there's this general problem when we talk about smart cities as being a procurement issue. Um, we treat it as something that's of only interest to the tech community or the IT community. So my final point really is to say smart cities give us the tools, amazing tools, but without the powers to apply them to really important stuff, they're irrelevant. And meanwhile with devolution we've got some remarkable powers that we're going to be handing to regions, but if they do not have even the most basic capacity to use the data they've already got, they have no chance of making use of the exponentially greater amounts from the wonderful world of Internet Things. In short, we don't just need smart cities or empowered cities, we need smart, empowered cities. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie, for what I imagine is probably the most passionate presentation about data there has ever been. <laughs> <laughs> um, incidentally, I realised halfway through that that Gavin and Eddie are both sat there with actual... I'm clearly stuck in an analogue age. Um, one of, the, one of the, the patterns that I've noticed comes across quite a lot in the, in the smart cities debate is there's this tension between top-down and bottom-up. We often talk about smart cities as if it's uh, something that's imposed from above by a government agency or, or a tech firm, when actually the way most of us engage with technology for our smartphones or whatever it may be is, is much more bottom-up. Um, and those two don't necessarily mesh. Um, I'm just interested in, in, in your thoughts on this, Russell, whether you think that one of the reasons that, that perhaps our cities are not as smart as they could be is that the idea of smart cities is not being presented in the way that people actually experience technology. 
Um, well, I think, you know, kind of broadening that, that point slightly, I think the, the reality is, I think people intuitively get the fact that there's technology out there that could be used. I think the, 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 the bottom-up route is very difficult in the sense that, you know, people will come up with very small examples. I think the, the issue is one of a broader point, and the, the topic of budgets came up a minute ago. I think the, the overall, there's two things, there's budgets and there's leadership, and maybe they're combined. But on a, on a regional basis, and that's the reason why devolution may actually help with the smart cities discussion, is because you're going to have more autonomous uh, areas that can collaborate hopefully closer together, that can create more of an ecosystem to look at solutions that will have a benefit and real impact on how people can live their lives and improve services. So I don't think it's a, the, the bottom up kind of sp spawns lots of innovation and ideas around smart parking or smart bikes and, and the like, but I don't think it really addresses the bigger issue of how you can have real cross-city solutions that tackle services that have a real impact on people's lives, such as the hospital analysis that um, we've, we've looked at as well, which is improving parking, patient output, and uh, weather conditions to then correlate all our data and, and give services to customers via their iPhones, right, which help people make better decisions and actually improve efficiency. So the fact that people are walking around with smartphones in their pocket should be an enabler and a vehicle for that kind of two-way communication uh, as opposed to say, kind of looking at it as a bottom-up or top-down. I think it's, it's inevitably a bit of both. It's both. Mm. Yeah. And, and Gavin, I'm going to turn to you. Um, another problem I think there often is in this debate is it can be quite difficult to get beyond the theoretical and sort of really get a handle on, on what the concrete benefits of, uh, of open data, or indeed any data, can actually be. I'm just wondering if um, you could point to a couple of examples of uh, Certainly. the kind of projects. Yeah, and I was going to actually to pick up on the last point as well. I think you know one of the amazing things about the age uh, that we're in is that very small teams can achieve very large impact. And if you look at some, how many people in the room use WhatsApp? No, one, two, quite a few, yeah, lots of hands go up after one does. 35 engineers in the company. They send three billion messages a day. Uh, the, 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 the economy of scale in the digital economy is staggering. And I'll give you one example uh, for now on um, a company that we've helped to incubate called Transport API. Transport API initially kind of had to fight with Transport for London to get the data out. TfL thought that they should build the app, that they should be the data releaser, <coughs> they should do all of the things for the consumer. After much conversation, they opened up their data. Transport API then aggregate that. City Mapper is an app that is then was originally built on top of Transport API and reaches over a million people. Transport API now has over 70% of the country's transport data. Uh, the team is less than 20 people, and they have thousands of developers building things on top of their applications that impact literally millions of people. So the potential here is for very small, many parts loosely joined, fundamental to the architecture of the web. I should remind everybody as well, the web is the most successful information architecture in history. And the potential here is that everybody is connected to that. What we need from a top-down perspective is strong leadership, anchoring around standards, uh, the kind of work that we're doing now with the Treasury on creating an open banking API for UK banks, make sure that the liability is addressed, make sure that privacy is addressed, security, all of the other critical components are addressed, but some, in a way that enables the fintech community to really flourish. So I think there's, there's plenty of examples out there. Actually, there's hundreds of examples of the power of open data. Um, it's moved completely beyond the kind of early days of it all, would all be lovely, but you're all using open data every day, whether it's a GPS signal, uh, whether it's transportation, uh, whether it's healthcare, you're using open data already in your daily lives. Lord Holmes, what, what are the examples of, of smart cities technology that have impressed you? I think the, the, the stuff that can be done around transport is truly transformational. Because if, you, if you think about the, the concentration 
of people we have in these urban areas. And I've already heard earlier it fantastically fits within the 80-20 rule as everything uh, seems to need to, um, in a, any example, 80% of people living in urban city areas. That's fine, but it's got to move. It's got to be efficient. So a lot of the apps and the use of data to enable smart transport systems, smart ways of accessing cities, to be given ahead of time stuff if you're on a particular route, to be able to react in real time and change to be able to get somewhere quicker, more effectively, more efficiently. All of this stuff is going to be vital and when you layer in the potential of autonomous vehicles bring to this, you could truly see cities moving far, far more efficiently than they are today in a way which won't be just a marginal gain. These are big leaps and it, again it's about using this tech to do stuff which truly does make a difference rather than something which is just novel and interesting but doesn't actually shift the dial at all. And uh, Eddie, one of the things that strikes me about the examples that people are citing is they're often private sector applications of public data. Um, do you think that's that's the the model we're looking at here, or do you think government itself could actually be be doing uh, playing a more proactive role rather than shunting the data out and letting other people play with it? So, one of the the problems I see with um, and I'd be interested to get Gavin's perspective on this is the difference in the approach to open data we have in the UK compared to in the USA. So. Um, I know London in particular has done a lot with the London data store, um, central government as well doing a huge amount as are other cities to try and push out data um, and waiting for other people to do um, stuff with it um, but there's a challenge to that. Um, if you are saying well, we want the, the private sectors come and engage with that data, if I was an entrepreneur standing in front of you as a group of investors and I said guys I've got a great idea for a business uh, but it depends on one resource, it comes from one supplier and it has no future guarantee of uh, or future delivery um, or quality. Would you invest in my business? I think you'd be a brave investor if you did and I think that's the position we currently put a lot of our businesses in with open data because at the moment open data in many cases is just a cost centre to cities and to government. It's something we push out and it's costing money to do that. Compare that though with the New York example where first and foremost they regard themselves as the first consumer of their own data. They derive their own value from it, they save their own money from it, they use it to achieve important objectives. A subset of that they then release out to the public. And then businesses love that because they know the government takes it so seriously and invests in the time and the quality and the SLAs around it. They have the greater confidence to go and build businesses with it. And so I do see this missing piece in many UK cities where we haven't realised the power of open data for our own purposes in the public sector, in addition to everything, all the cool stuff that, as Gavin's already mentioned, that external developers and citizens can do. Gavin, would you like to respond? Certainly. No, I, th I think it's... Um it's about time passing, you know, it's behaviour change. Mm -hmm. The number one kind of way that we see the evolution of this, whether it's in government or whether it's in businesses, people start by sharing data more effectively. And as they share more, da more data more effectively, and they develop users of that information who are making better decisions, they start to do more of it, and it, it, you end up being open. And there's a good parallel here between the early days of the web. One of the big catalysts for the web was intranets. Technical managers inside companies said, oh, this internet technology is really useful. We'll build our own one because it'll help us share information better internally. What's happened is the firewalls gradually got further and further away. In fact, we've been asked by some multinationals now, what would happen if they just took the firewall off their company? We put all the HR records over there and the, the really confidential stuff securely. Let's just open up the rest of it. And I think there's, you know, one of the reasons that the ODI exists is to stimulate the demand side. We work directly with companies to help them understand how to use public data. But in that journey, they also start to publish their own open data. And all of the partners that we work with have, uh, are on this journey of saying, actually, if we can work more effectively. I'll start sharing it with you, and then I'll start sharing it with the next office. By the end of it, they're sharing it with the rest of the web. And they, if you can enable that discovery process, and one of the standards we've created called an Open Data Certificate addresses exactly the question, and we've run this now across the whole of data.gov.uk, is how long is that data going to be maintained for? 
so can I invest in it? So building confidence, one of the things we created on behalf of the private sector was a way for the public sector to publish, to give them those kind of guarantees. And that's been run across the whole of data.gov in the US now as well, because they had actually the same challenges. That's why you've got you know, pockets of great innovation. New York is doing, uh, going great guns. Uh, London is doing well. Manchester is actually uh, doing well. Bristol, Sheffield, Leeds, etc. They're all doing fantastic work, but in, pocket, in pockets. So it really, we're at the early adoption stage. But what happens in internet time, you know, nine months, you know, double that impact double it again after nine months. So in 10 years from now, what's the impact going to be? And that's what that's the change that we're looking at in, in our lifetimes. We've got just under 20 minutes left, so I think it's an excellent time to open to questions from the floor. Um, I believe there is a microphone in circulation. Yes, excellent. Um, there's a gentleman here is so keen, he's already got a hand up. Can you start there? If you could say who you are and where you're from. Yeah, uh, Dan Watkins from Tooting, actually I was the, the parliamentary candidate there, but I'm actually a, an entrepreneur in, in the technology field, which is more relevant for this question. Just on what you said, um, why don't public institutions which control this, these data flows, why don't they charge a, a, a license fee, monthly fee as a private organisation would, to provide those data streams, give the guarantee on quality with them, which, which you can do with, that, with that, that fee, because for a lot of entrepreneurs doing you know, apps and those kind of products, they would actually expect to pay for data. One of my businesses, we pay private organisations to, to buy in data, but they must give us the quality guarantee, thus we sell it on for a bigger margin in our app to our, to our consumers and, and, and everyone's happy and it, and it becomes obviously an income stream for, for government. Relying on government to do front end applications, I think is, I don't think that's going to happen. So uh, I'm just interested to know, are there any organisations of public sector organisa uh, you know, enterprises with, with, with data where, they, where they're charging or are they looking to charge? If I can jump in there, so, so one of the business models for open data, because open data is data that anyone can use for any purpose, is a service level agreement model. So you can have openly licensed data and a service level agreement. I think for private companies that actually works very effectively and a lot of the startups, we've got 35 startups now that we've helped use that kind of business model. For government, the argument is the public's already paid for it. So why, why would we charge again? Why should we charge again? And there's a really important underpinning question here is what kinds of data sets should we be treating as national data infrastructure or city data infrastructure? Now, we don't, there are, there are good analogies here with roads. Most roads you can use without toll, some that you can uh, use with tolls. So. I think that's a, a good sort of anchor point for discussion as well. But Eddie said some of these data sets aren't, aren't good enough quality and, and therefore something might need to change. Well, yeah. oh, so, I mean, if I can jump in on that and I, I kind of speak with two hats. So the reason I ended up at Policy Exchange was that I'd left my previous employer to set up um, an app company using live transport data. Uh, and I have the, the badge of honour of being a magnificently failed entrepreneur when this venture didn't work at all. And my, my final conclusion was that I could build a product, I just couldn't turn it into a business model. And the reason, one of my many excuses for why this went so badly, was that some of the data from the private sector I wanted to use um, would just made it unviable in order to get money back through an app. So cost was prohibitive for me as a wannabe data entrepreneur. On the other hand, I sit here with my looking at the public sector hat on and I do strongly believe that one way or another the public sector needs to make sure that open data is not just a cost centre. One way, perhaps a crude way, is to charge for it and you will always have the challenge there of where do you get the price point right so that what's appropriate to charge for an absolute you know, a tech giant um, is also appropriate for a, a one-person startup who's literally just trying to do a proof of concept. Um, I would prefer them to start by doing that sort of Moda New York example of using their own data to get their own value so that they make sure that it's in their own interests to deliver it for the long term. The charging for it, I think, is a poor <coughs> second choice. Yeah, and uh, to add to that as well, there's an open data charter that the G8 signed two years ago. There's the Open Government Partnership now with 80 countries who've mandated uh, or agreed between them that certain data sets will be made open by default. And certainly we have a default in the UK that public sector data should fall under an open government licence by default. I think my argument around cost is open is usually cheaper uh, if you do it right. 
so there's huge cost savings from actually just moving to open by default. I'm going to turn back to the floor to try and get some, as many questions as possible in. Come on, I can feel the questions bubbling up inside you. Don't, <laughs> don't make me pick on someone. Okay, well, we'll I, I'm going to turn to this end of the, the panel then. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in exploring this idea of charging for, for public data further because from conversations I've had with people at public authorities uh, recently, I know a lot of them feel that at a time of austerity, they are sat on this this uh, store of data that clearly has commercial value. Should they not be allowed to to make some of the uh, make uh, fill some of the gaps in their funding by by exploiting it commercially? And Lord Holmes, where do you stand on this one? I think it's it's an interesting point, which obviously in the environment we're in will we'll come up. But I think a better way to look at this stuff is a resource which enables massive possibility within those organisations, so within the local authorities in this particular example, they've got a phenomenal resource to draw on it first for all of their own benefits. And as we were discussing um, just before the panel started, the phenomenal thing about data, like almost no other resource on the planet is, the more people interact with it, they're not depleting, sucking it out of the well, you're actually increasing improving and making more of that data. So in that sense, it's a pretty unique to split an infinitive there, just to see if there's any pedants in the audience. <laughs> Something can't be pretty unique. Uh, even a policy exchange forum, it can't be pretty unique. But it, it's an extraordinary resource in that sense, if you get it right, that the incentive is on the local authority or the government, whoever holds that data, to have it, to your point, in tip-top condition because you're drawing on it yourself. That's a phenomenal result. And rather than looking at a sort of something that seems, it seems kind of a, a very cheap way of looking at it, it's just saying, I will try and price this stuff up and uh, you know, put it out there. Whereas actually it's about the resource that is held internally and then getting those right connections so you're adding to it and the thing you know, grows and expands rather than be depleted by those connections. Um. Russell, I'm going to put a slightly different question to you. Um, what do you think, I mean, from a, from a private sector standpoint, what do you see as the barriers to cities and other government bodies making better use of their data? What are the things that stop them from doing these things? I mean, maybe slightly controversially, I think part of what the government and the local councils have not done over the years is you know, where you've got a city council and a county council, they've not looked at where they can share data, point number one. Point number two, they have, over the years, and I think historically, one of the perhaps more controversial areas is you know, when Oxford County Council or City Council is giving permission for a subcontractor to build a, uh, a shopping park and uh, with related parking and the like, there's no contracts in there typically that enable Oxford and various other county councils to take that data. So there should be a contract, in my view, between you know, when the council's giving out the data, there should be a contractual obligation for the council to then get that data. Now, whether they choose to then package it and sell it um, is, a, is, a, is a next element and evolution on that. But I think the point for uh, looking at cities in the future is the, the ability to start baking in how they can work with the private sector to bring their own data and equally uh, improve that data based on all of the information they can get by working with their subcontractors. And I think that would help not only decision making but equally create vast repositories of data that we can then use to start analysing that we couldn't and can't do at the moment. Are there any further questions from that? Aha, we found one. Uh, where's the microphone got to? Yes, it's a lady over here. Well, yeah, what's the internet? No, that's not my question. <laughs> Blonde from Alaska. Thank you. You can just say who you are. Yes, I can. Um, Charlotte Peacock from um, Mob the Wands Beck, which is based up in Northumberland, so rather more of a rural constituency, really. Um, this is all sort of a very new topic to me, so I'm afraid it's not a particularly deep and meaningful question. Um, but I wonder, um, it doesn't seem to be something which is taken up by local authorities in any way. Is that due to a lack of knowledge, do you think, of, of sort of savings and 
how it could be implemented and therefore just a complete misunderstanding really of, of what this could be used for. I can't imagine that um, Northumberland County Council would have any idea of the use that they could make um, or would even entertain such a thing um, out of using data in this way. So it's really just to get your view on, on what, whether you think that is a barrier. Well, I mean, ju just to answer that, my experience, um, certainly talking to local authorities, is that actually, as Gavin um, mentioned, there's pockets of absolute brilliance um, out there. And I know it Leeds doing remarkable stuff. If you want to go to Camden, they're doing incredible stuff. Um, recently, my colleague Cameron Scott, sitting on the front row, uh, and I have been talking uh, to uh, Newcastle um, City Council, um, and was it North... Tyneside uh, Council as well, and they have really got this, really, really got this. I think in Manchester as well, maybe not um, hugely publicised yet, but they are working on various initiatives to make sure that, that this starts happening. The challenge, I think, is part, um, there is still this residual local authority mindset that they have to sort of invent the wheel themselves, that they want that ownership. And I think there is always this risk of taking the concept of localism way too far, in that we can all go about our own digital revolution, but if you look at data, data delivers value through being shared and integrated, and too often local authorities are keeping it siloed. And with the whole technology revolution, what do we know? Well, technology delivers value when you scale it. And again, too much of local authorities and the public sector and central government, let's not um, pretend they're not involved, again, are keeping it small scale. So. I'm keen to see more mechanisms to make it easy to do this stuff. <coughs> I also don't believe it's realistic for every local authority to get its own data whizzes in-house. And that is why I think there's this massive opportunity with city devolution that at a city scale, we can have that core of data, of tech talent, to make it happen at a city scale. Because the problem is, at the moment, you've got, say, Camden doing brilliant stuff in London, but it's just Camden. and. We need to make it have a bigger impact. The more we can scale that best practice, the better. I think the Moda model is the way to start it. I'm actually going to go back to the floor because I'm aware of limitations on time and it would be good to hear from some more people. So there's a gentleman I, I, I'm sure I do need a um, So what, what is it about those councils? Sorry, can you say who you are? Uh, Richard Wheatmouth. Uh, I'm the deputy chairman for the North East region. Uh, um, what is it about those councils that, uh, you, if, you, if you said, well, this, this is the reason why uh, they go out on, on this direction, is it one individual in an organisation who just happens to have a bit of a passion and, it's, and it stops to build from there, or is it that they outsource services to companies? And North Tyneside uses an example, I think they use Capita a lot for, for things and they've outsourced and privatised a lot of their service delivery in, in, the, in the council. What, what is it, do you think? Gavin, do you want to take that one? I think the patterns we've seen is things work most effectively when you've got the, if you like, the, the junior alpha geek developer who's champing at the bit to do something and top level leadership. Those things combine, so you've got the air cover for the individual to go and do things and you've got the individual. But I think, you know, very much to the last point as well, what I was going to say is I think we need to train everyone. I, I don't think it's the case that we shouldn't have digital skills in every organisation. And I think it should be part of the curriculum. You know, data literacy and data skills should be part of our uh, high school curriculum. If I can just go back to that, I think it's not so much uh, a skills issue. I think it's an awareness issue. I'm um, talking about sharing data. I don't even think they know they've got the data to use themselves, let alone then. They're, they come hand in hand. Yeah. I think. We, we tend to talk about smart cities. I'm wondering if there's an urban-rural split at work here. And if so, what, what is at root of that? Uh, Russell, do you want to comment on that? An urban-rural split, I think there probably is, in, in, the t in the sense of a lot of the applications, if you will, for smart cities very much lend themselves to high-density urban environments. Um, you've got practicalities in some of the more remote areas, and actually we're working with uh, on TV white space as a spectrum in which you can de deliver and compensate just for even bandwidth issues and, and data distribution issues. So. You know, I think there is a challenge um, on how you extend some of these concepts into more of the rural communities. There are some good examples of rural community uh, smart concepts, um, but you know, I think the biggest, the bigger challenges, and frankly, the bigger opportunities, uh, both commercially and for the public sector, are in the high urbanised uh, environments. Just curious, can you give one of those examples? There's a. Um, uh, one of the ones was around how you it's effectively home care 
in the rural communities. So uh, how you can just send vehicles and, and, and use a fleet of vehicles on a smarter basis to aggregate demand to then go and pick out up people in remote communities to then bring them into the city so they can do the shopping or go to the doctor's appointments or whatever that is. And I think that that's the challenge is there's so much emphasis on trying to understand either the kind of macro council level as to what data they've got, which is very much around kind of a city project, or real innovation of urban uh, efficiency. That there aren't that many examples that, that stretch out into the rural communities, but the one uh, example I gave was the one that I think is just trying to look at how you can service a lot of people that, that do live in the rural communities and how you can aggregate uh, services so it can be more efficient. Are there any other questions from there? Uh, there's a gentleman over there who hasn't spoken yet. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Nick Webb from Newport West Conservatives. I'm a former parliamentary candidate and also a former police commissioner candidate. And it's actually on that second thing that I, I wanted to follow up. Quite an open question, really. First of all, um, we've not had PCCs mentioned in this discussion so far. Um, I'm aware in Gwent the situation occurred where the incoming police commissioner completely changed the way crime was recorded, but it was a very high-level discussion that was completely inaccessible to the people he was serving. I suspect he did the right thing, but I just wonder whether, first of all, there are any examples of how PCCs have engaged in, in open data, um, and secondly, whether you think there are opportunities there that they can do so better. Who'd like to say that one? Anyone know about uh, policing? Um, I don't know a great deal, but I can um, give uh, maybe a couple of examples, uh, of one orthogonal and one directly related. One is uh, we worked with uh, Telefonica and uh, the different authorities around London to combine mobile phone signals uh, with uh, crime rates to create a predictive model for uh, where the crime hotspots were on your mobile. So it's say, you know, this, you're entering a peak time for a peak area. So there are predictive models there and actually Telefonica opened up some of its data in the process. So it's a good example of where some of the private sector data can be opened up to create new insights. Uh, another is around actually the fire stations closures in, the, in, in London where we took what was a 50 page PDF file which was obviously very accessible to everyone and turned it into an interactive map. So you could literally click through and see you know, what's the impact to me in my area, what's the response time in minutes. So I think there's lots of different opportunities there, but I think it's, it's you know it's a bit like you know coming back to the this kind of skills question. It does feel like we're still, still mid '90s web, where people are saying, "Why do I need a website or an email address?" And you know, bookshops are uploading a photograph of the front of their shop rather than you know getting all the data, which is what Amazon did. So I think that there's a huge potential here for really engaging and, and joining together. And one of the powers of open and shared data is you can start to link it. And when you can link it together, you can start to derive new insights. And, and really, that's where the this mind shift, which was we talked about earlier, is absolutely critical. If I can just briefly come in on that, um, just to make the observation that I think uh, whether it's a police and crime commissioner or a mayor or whatever senior leadership role, they absolutely have um, they should have input into how data is used and it's important that they do have that leadership role. But also, again, without wishing to keep banging on about New York, one of the key lessons there was that it was the frontline workers who can give you far more um, context about the value of what data really matters and that could make substantive improvements. And I would encourage that both the leadership have to be engaged but they should spend a lot of time as well with their front line, their bobbies on the beat going, you know what a high crime area looks like, you know what the signs are to look for, T tell us what they are, how do you quantify it, do we record it, do we record it well, who sees it, those are the kind of conversations we need to have if we were looking for real public service reform. We are very nearly out of time, so just to wrap up, I'm going to rather cruelly put everyone on the spot and ask them what one change they would like to see made to actually kind of bring this, this vision into being. Um, Lord Terms, if we could start with you. Thank you. I'll inevitably not answer the question directly. <laughs> There's a real question of leadership. We need to smash the silos and connect across departments within local authorities and across local authorities and fundamentally for the long term we need, as we put in our select committee report in, into digital opportunity in February this year, we need to have 
digital literacy as a core competency as important as numeracy and literacy in our schools and that's the way to truly drive this in the long term. Awesome. I, building on a lot of what's just been said to be honest I mean I think the there's a there's a degree of budgetary investment that we're going to have to make if we believe that there are longer term economical and societal benefits to do smart cities that's not going to happen overnight and it requires budgetary cycles that go beyond one year or two years so I think it's just having that leadership on ensuring that we can invest now for long-term payback is important. Eddie? Um, I would like the government to say that as a precondition of getting further devolved powers a city should set up an office of data analytics. Last but not least, Gavin? I think there needs to be a clear statement of what is the city's data infrastructure policy and linked to that a chief data officer uh, for the city. Well, thank you very much. Um, we actually got some real answers to that question, so it's a nice <laughs> surprise. Um, well, thank you to, to all our speakers and, and thank you to Nominate for sponsoring today's event. If we could just put our hands together. To, to